Okay, uh, guys, um, we have a treat for you today. What I have here, this is a, a, a satellite receiver that was uh, given to me by an old friend of mine, customer of mine, and um, it's experiencing a, a problem. It won't turn on. More specifically, if we look at the fan, you can see that the fan is just pulsing. See that? And all the lights in the front panel do the same thing. So that's telling me the problem is in this bad boy here. This is the switching power supply. So what we're going to do is I'm going to repair this thing and I'm going to let you guys in on a little treat here. I'm going to show you the ins and outs and how I'm going to go about troubleshooting and replacing the defective components. Now right off the bat, just from the very nature of how this thing is uh, failing, I'm I'm going to go out on a limb and say it's probably this capacitor here, and maybe this one over here, and these ones down here. These are in the secondary stage of this power supply. And there's probably two or three of them that are causing the problem. Uh, how these power supplies operate, is they take the AC voltage coming in, they change it to a DC voltage, a very high voltage, a couple hundred volts. Then they run through an oscillator and create a high frequency AC uh, signal that goes through this small transformer. It's rectified into DC on this side. They take a sample of that DC voltage and they compare it to a known reference. In most cases they use a Zener diode. They come up with an error voltage and the error voltage is passed through this optocoupler here which isolates the, 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 the cold DC side from the hot AC side. That provides a feedback loop. What happens is capacitors in the power supply start to uh, fail and they are no longer rectifying the voltage properly or, or filtering the voltage properly that is rectified through the diode block which is these guys here. And uh, your result, the power supply is either dead or in this case it's trying to start and it's shutting down. So we're going to take this power supply out and prep it for repair. And then I'm going to go through the procedure of, um, of repairing it. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to unplug the power because well, we don't want to have any, any power on this thing when I'm working on it. And now I'm going to proceed to uh, take the power supply out. And unlike other videos, this time I actually have a tripod so I can show you the procedure that we're doing. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to unplug the power supply here from the main board. And then we're going to remove the retaining screws to remove the power supply so that we can work on this as a separate unit out of the cabinet. Now because these power supplies can store a nasty charge in the main filter capacitor, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to short out the main filter capacitor. I'm just going to use my trusty needle nose pliers here just to make sure that there's no voltage on here and I'm just doing that by shorting out the main filter capacitor which I've done now. So now we know that this bad boy is no longer going to pose a threat. And I'm going to unplug the power cord here so that we have a separate uh, circuit board for servicing. And I, now I can just set the unit aside on my cluttered workbench. But now we have this little tiny, little teeny tiny space on my uh, workbench here, which is really all I need for uh, to repair something like this. We're going to be using a, a, a specialized piece of test equipment called an ESR meter, which will measure the equivalent uh, series resistance of the capacitors. And I just so happen that I have a, a home-built ESR meter right here. So we're going to take this meter and we're going to measure the, the, uh, the uh, low ohms resistance value of these electrolytic capacitors and determine which ones are defective. Okay, one of the things we have to do before we can proceed is we need to disconnect one leg of the capacitors in question because some of them are connected in parallel with each other if you look at how the circuitry is uh, is arranged it goes through a diode then it goes through one capacitor and then there's a little coil here and then there's another capacitor so we have multiple capacitors in parallel which will affect our results so what we want to do is we want to disconnect one lead of each of these capacitors that I'm going to that I'm going to check for um, for high ESR value. We only have to disconnect one side. So I've got my trusty uh, um, soldering iron here. I'm not using the blowtorch this time, but I have this really old antique soldering iron that I've had uh, since God was a child. And that was a long time ago, trust me. So we're gonna disconnect one, uh, 
We're gonna disconnect one lead here and that way I can isolate. It really doesn't matter whether we remove the positive or the negative lead as long as we can open up one side then we can measure the capacitor uh, without any influence from the rest of the circuit and without any influence from the other capacitors. So we'll just take out these ones here and we'll start by measuring the ESR on these two capacitors which I suspect is going to be uh, it's going to be very high. Uh, typically when you put it at uh, an AC voltage and how an ESR meter works is it we're not measuring measuring the microfarads per se of the capacitor we're measuring its ability to pass an AC signal. An electrolytic capacitor should be it should appear almost like a dead short to an AC signal. Uh, this meter is going to place a, about a hundred kilohertz signal into the uh, capacitor and it's going to measure what goes through and good capacitors will pass mo most of the signal bad ones which are starting to build up resistance internally will show as a high value now when we talk high value we're talking very very low ohms here like these capacitors here they're rated 470 microfarads at 35 volts so if we look on our little chart here we go to 470 a 35 volt 470 capa a microfarad capacitor a new capacitor should be measure no more than 0 0.09 ohms that is a very low value so the first thing we need to do is we need to zero out the meter so we turn the meter on and we short the probes together we find out that our value on the our resistance on here is measuring 0.14 I press the button again and now I've zeroed out the, the, the resistance of the leads so now I can proceed to measure my capacitors and see what they're measuring this first guy here that I measure is coming up at 1.2 ohms. Now you might think 1.2 ohms is low, but 1.2 ohms is much higher than 0 0.09. Let's measure the second bad boy here. And it's coming up at 0.26. Not as bad as the other one, but still it's much higher than 0 0.09, which is what you would expect to find a new capacitor measuring that would be the absolute worst case ESR values for new capacitors so if you got a new capacitor that's worse than that it's already not very good they should be measuring a lot lower than that so there's two right off the bat that are bad I'm going to unsolder this other bad boy over here and we're going to measure that one and I, I bet you will find that this other bad boy is also gone here so let's just do that and I'll be right back and now it's loose you can see the lead moving I think if we well, maybe you can't but I can see the lead moving here. So we're going to measure this guy here, and we find that this guy here is 6.5. 6.5 ohms. This is a, again, a uh, this one is a 220 at 10 volts. So 220 at 10 volts should be no more than 0 0.06, and it's measuring 6.5. So we know that that bad boy is also gone. And I, I, I think that probably in this case, these are the only three capacitors that are gone on this power supply. One, because I've got experience repairing uh, switching power supplies. Um, my credentials are over 20 years as a professional uh, diagnostic technician, now retired and in a different field. Um, but um, we can also look at these capacitors, and I don't know if it's going to show up on video or not, but the tops, I like this little camera. This is my little Sony um, little plug for Sony. This is a, a little TX100 little pocket uh, still camera with video capabilities, 1080p video. But the beauty of this camera is I can get this thing like, 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 like an inch or two from the lens. Uh, literally, I'm like, I'm within a half an inch of the lens. And macro on this is incredible. If you look at the top of these capacitors, they're, they're bulged. That one is quite not quite as easy to see, but I think if you look at this other one here, you'll see that the top is kind of bulged right here. So that's the dead giveaway right there that these guys are, are cooked. And um, I knew going in that those were going to be the ones before I even did anything. The, the test with the ESR meter was just to confirm what I already suspected. So we're going to go over to the parts bin and we're going to grab some new capacitors. And we're going to put the new capacitors in. And uh, we're going to put this sucker back in the, in the chassis. And um, I bet you 10 to 1 it's going to fire up. So let's go find some new components and we'll continue this. Check this out. When we actually pulled one of these caps out, 
we measure it and it's measuring it like 95 ohms like almost completely open so we got some replacements we're gonna put in here and uh, we're gonna mount the replacements and uh, see what happens I have my solder we're gonna solder these capacitors in place here there's one the other okay that's uh, two of them done yeah this is a little different color than the other but same capacitor and we're gonna now do this other last boy bad boy over here so we'll take this one out ouch that was hot solder that I just set my hand on <laughs> take this last guy out here and uh, there we go we'll go find a replacement for that bad boy and uh, this thing should be working we fit the new capacitor in observing the correct polarity there we go negative to negative and positive to positive and now we just get a solder in this bad boy and try not to burn myself again cut off the excess leads okay now the power supply should be ready to go back into the uh, receiver so we're going to uh, do that get the power supply here gonna mount it back down inside the cabinet where it came out of three screws that hold the power supply in place we'll reattach it I was once told that uh, a switching power supply it's just a fancy name for a voltage to smoke converter what do you think you think we're gonna make some smoke today or do you think this thing's gonna power up I say it powers up so plug our cord back in here plug in our main power and Plug in our power and turn this sucker on. And oh, might help if I might help if I plug the power in. Eh? Okay, now we got power. Now for the moment of truth. Actually, we don't have power because my power bar is not working. Now my power bar is working. Look at this. The fan is a spinning. See that? Stick my finger in there. Fan is spinning. What does this display say on the front here? Uh, display says nothing, but it's booting up. These things are kind of slow at boot up. We'll just give it a few seconds here. And it should be ready to turn on. There's how to repair a power supply. I cannot believe how dim these displays are. Actually, the display isn't that dim. It's just that the uh, the lighting in my workshop here is so incredibly bright. I um, yep, 
it's working. He watches Al Jazeera off of uh, this is a free to air uh, satellite box, so it gets all the free channels. But uh, there it is, it's working, it's powered up, so it's ready to go back to the customer and make the customer happy that he got a, a box that probably nobody else is going to even take the time to look at and tell them to throw it out and buy a new one but there you go power supply repair uh, no I had to turn the lights out in here because my my workshop is incredibly bright I operate with a 400 watt um, metal halide lamp as well as like a 45 or 42 watt uh, uh, compact fluorescent right above the uh, bench throws a lot of light on for one so I can see what I'm doing but two it makes for better pictures but uh, it certainly doesn't make it easy to see the display but there you go uh, thanks for watching 12 volt vids and uh, this one's working on a little more power than 12 volts but um, there you go that's how to repair a ViewSat 9000 high definition satellite receiver a free to air satellite receiver um, very common problem with these is that those three components fail and they fail time and time again and uh, now ViewSat is out of business getting one of these things repaired is next to impossible so there you go that's how to fix a ViewSat 9000 thanks for watching we'll make some more informative videos later bye